Good morning, students. It's Thursday, 28 January, 2021. Today is the second of three days on the essay by Sarah Conley. And I'd like you to read, um, I, first of all, I assume that you've read all of Conley carefully and slowly. And you should probably be getting started reading the second item for the course, the essay by Carl Cohen. We will be spending both days next week on Cohen's essay. So <clears throat> get started on it, maybe read half of it slowly and carefully, and then finish it up over the weekend. Now, I'm running a little bit late this week. I had a couple of meetings on Wednesday. And remember, I have two sets of lectures to prepare each week. So this is the first of two lectures for you this week. And tomorrow I plan to do my ethics lecture for them. And then your second lecture will be up on Saturday. So I apologize for that. Your two lectures this week are going to be on Thursday and Saturday. Next week they'll probably be on either Tuesday and Thursday or Wednesday and Friday. But keep in mind what I said earlier. Um, as long as you get two lectures per week, it shouldn't matter which days they get posted. Okay, so let's get back to Conley. I don't think today's lecture will take uh, more than an hour. And the reason is we're spending three full days on her essay. I think two days would be pushing it. Three days may be a little bit longer than we need. Um, so um, I'll cover about um, the next third of her essay today, and then we'll wrap things up on Saturday. Now keep in mind, just a quick review of what we've covered. Conley doesn't really argue in favor of a right to health care in this essay, although she gestures in that direction when she says that there are two possible bases for a right. The first is welfare, and the second is autonomy. And you can see how both of those would apply in the case of health care. So while she doesn't really argue for a right to health care, she does kind of point out the direction such an argument would take. So really, she's assuming, for the purposes of this essay, she's assuming that there's a right to at least a decent minimum of health care. And her objective in this essay is to show that there have to be limits on the right to health care. We cannot simply have a right to everything we need for the most perfect health. Healthcare resources are scarce, and therefore there have to be limits. There, that means that there may be an occasion in which you need something for your health and you're unable to get it, right? It's simply too expensive. Um, you could think of that as rationing if you want, although she doesn't use that term. As far, at least as far as I recall, she doesn't use that term. Now compare food. Food compared to medical care is comparatively plentiful rather than scarce. And that's why food is fairly cheap. Uh, and, while, and, and why if we as a society say that there's a right to eat or a right to food, we can be pretty extravagant in seeing to it that people have a good diet, even though they can't pay for it. But healthcare, as Conley points out, can be and typically is expensive. For example, surgery, as you know, surgery is not cheap. Um, and what about equipment that is used in medical care? MRIs, magnetic resonance imaging machines, and CAT scans, and so on. Simple diagnostic tests are very, very expensive. And so because these uh, devices are scarce relative to the need, they are costly. And those costs um, mean that we're spending money for health care that we could be spending for other needs, such as education, national defense, building of bridges and libraries and roadways and things like that. So remember, health care dollars are competing for education dollars and national defense dollars and and so on. I want to read a, a short passage from Conley on page 311. So I hope you've printed out your copy of Conley and have it there with you. If not, maybe you can pause this video, go get your uh, copy, and turn to page 311. I want to read what she says about the World Health Organization. 
which is often identified by its acronym, W-H-O. You can even pronounce it as if it were a word like who, the who, not to be confused with the musical group, the who. Here's what she says on page 311. For example, the World Health Organization has a constitution which enshrines, sorry, I lost my place. The World Health Organization has a constitution which, quote, enshrines the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental right of every human being, unquote. And it goes on to say that, quote, the right to health means that states, and by that it means nation states or countries, states must generate conditions in which everyone can be as healthy as possible, unquote. Now here's Conley commenting on that language. The WHO specifically states that there's no right actually to be healthy. Notice she italicized the word be to emphasize it. There's no right actually to be healthy, presumably because there may be nothing anyone can do to bring some people to good health. Just as we say ought implies can, we may say X's right to claim Z from Y implies Y's ability to supply Z to X. So let me, let me pause for a moment and comment on that. There's an old saying in ethics or moral philosophy, ought implies can. And that's just a shorthand for saying that it makes no sense to say that somebody ought to do something unless that person can do it. So it would be pointless to say that you ought to have lifted an automobile off the person trapped under it. Your response would be, how? I'm physically unable to lift an automobile. So how can I have an obligation morally to do so? So that's, that's um, what's meant by the slogan, ought implies can. And what Conley is saying is this, to say that somebody has a right to something as against someone else is to imply that that someone else is able to supply it. And that may not be the case. So let's continue with, the, with Conley's quotation. She says, still, the standard articulated in the WHO Constitution is a very high one. The idea is that people have a right not merely to moderately good health, the health that would allow them to partake in most meaningful activities, but rather to the best health the state or government can help them to obtain. And there is no limit articulated as to what costs the state may run up in doing that. This, I argue, is wrong. So this, this uh, statement by Conley, um, I'm sorry, this statement by the WHO uh, runs afoul of what Conley has been arguing. She is claiming that the right to health or to health care must be limited. And then she reads this WHO declaration and finds that there is seemingly a right to unlimited health for every human being on earth, which is, last, last I checked, is over 7 billion people. So Conley says it's wrong. It's at least unrealistic to say that there's a right to the very best health care for every human being. So she's criticizing this organization's statement by the WHO. Um, you might say that in defense of the statement by the WHO, the World Health Organization, you might say that it's an exercise in rhetoric. Those are Conley's words. Maybe the statement is meant to be idealistic rather than realistic. It's, it supplies people around the world with an aspiration. We should all aspire to the very best health for each of our citizens, right? So this is something we should aspire to. Uh, one of my teachers, Joel Feinberg, called statements like this manifesto rights. These are rights that are proclaimed in manifestos, uh, which are often part of revolutionary movements. Workers have a right to a certain amount of pay. Workers have a right to a minimum wage that will allow them to support their family. So this is the kind of language used by 
uh, social movements to inspire people to make changes in society. So if that's all it is, I don't think Conley would have a problem with it, right? If, if the statement by the WHO saying that people have a right to the best health care available, uh, she would have no problem if that's simply stating an aspiration or a goal to which we should work or toward which we should work. But if it's meant to be realistic, she would say it's not. It's, there's simply no way, uh, given the cost of health care, that people can be provided with the very best health. Uh, there's simply too many people and the health care is too costly. So what is Conley's conclusion? Just to wrap up the first segment of her essay, she says on page 312, we have a right to health care, but that right is not unlimited. Now that's just a double, double negative. Not unlimited means limited. So let's read it again with that in mind. We have a right to health care, but that right is limited. And keep in mind that she has not supported the claim that there is a right to health care. In fact, think of her essay as saying the following, if there is a right to health care, then that right must be limited by cost or by considerations of cost. Okay, let's turn to the second half of her essay. She doesn't give a title to the first half. I gave it my own title in my notes. I have given it the title, bear with me for a moment. I gave it the title, The Right to Preventive Health Care, which is similar to her title. In fact, I think that is her title. Yes, it is. The Right to Preventive Health Care. Now, part two of her essay has a heading, and here it is. The heading is Public Health Regulations, colon, a right and an obligation. So Conley is now going to talk about public health regulations, regulations that are designed to keep health care costs down. And part of her argument is that correlative to the right to health care is a duty or obligation on the part of the citizenry to take steps to see that their health remains good. As you'll see, you'll see in a moment, Conley believes that most health care problems are self-imposed. They stem from people's bad decisions or maybe from people's lifestyles. That's a term she uses. So let's get started on this section. We'll work our way into it and then I'll pause at a particular moment, particular point and we'll pick up with it on my next lecture on Saturday. So let's talk for a moment about efficiency. It's a term I'm sure you've heard and maybe even used from time to time. It's a term used by economists. Economists are very much concerned with efficient processes, efficient production processes, efficient distribution processes, and so on. So we need to understand what efficiency is. Here's what Conley says on page 312, and then I'll comment on it. So listen carefully. All this talk about limiting the claims people can make for the maintenance or recovery of health may sound grim, as if it were necessary to abandon the needy. I think, though, that first and foremost, it is a call for efficiency in healthcare spending rather than abandonment. Unquote. So Conley is concerned that someone might read her article and think that she's arguing that there is no right to health care or that the right to health care is severely limited. And really, she doesn't mean it for her essay to be grim. Right? I think she's an optimist. She thinks that there are things we can do to see to it that people have an adequate amount of health care for most of their ailments and injuries. So what Conley really wants is efficiency. She wants a health care system that's efficient. What does that mean? Efficiency means, to put it in a pithy way, it means getting the most bang for your buck. Surely you've heard that expression. Getting the most bang, in this case, the most health or health care for your buck. And that means for your health care dollar. So we have a certain amount of health care dollars or resources 
And we want to use them wisely. We want to use them in such a way that we get the greatest amount of health care for the most people. And if we can, then we would say we have an efficient health care delivery system. Now, the word efficient, if you look it up in a good dictionary, you'll find a, de a definition like the following. And this is from my new Oxford American Dictionary, which is dated 2010, just a decade ago. Efficient means, especially of a system or machine, achieving maximum productivity with minimum wasted effort or expense. And that's just long, a long-winded way of saying getting the most bang for your buck. And that's what Conley's concern is. She wants to describe a healthcare delivery system that is efficient, or at least moves us toward efficiency. Ideally, Conley says on page 312, ideally methods of healthcare can be found that are good for the person who needs health care without imposing heavy burdens on those who provide it. So that's the ideal state of affairs, the ideal world. We have a health care system that provides good health care for those who need it at minimum expense for those who provide it. The taxpayers ultimately provide the resources for health care. Now, Ideal is usually contrasted with real. We can talk about the real world, which means the world as it actually is, with all of its warts and imperfections and so on. Or we can talk about the ideal world, a, a utopia, a world where everything is going well, where all of our needs are satisfied, all of our wants and desires are fulfilled. So Conley is saying, here's the ideal, right? This is what we should be striving for, a world in which all of people's health care needs are met, at least their important needs are met, at minimum expense for those who provide the resources. Well, she realizes that the ideal world is not the real world, right? So she's not confusing the two. Sometimes philosophers state the ideal uh, so that we know what we're headed toward or what we're striving for. And also, once you describe the ideal, you can measure your prog progress toward it. Suppose the ideal is unachievable. And maybe we can all agree, we'll never reach the ideal society. But that doesn't mean that the ideal is useless because um, we're here now, suppose we're right here, time-wise, and the ideal is far, far in the future, if we ever attain it at all. Uh, we can measure our progress toward the ideal. We can say, today we're here, tomorrow we'll be a little bit closer to the ideal. Ten years from now, if we work hard, we can be even closer, and so on. So one function of an ideal is to help us measure our progress and to feel good about it. Now obviously there's another possibility and that is regress. Progress, let me put the ideal back out here. Progress means moving toward the ideal. Regress would mean falling back away from the ideal. So at a minimum we want to make sure that we're not regressing and if we can we want to make progress toward this ideal state of affairs, this ideal world that she's described. So what is the main source of expense or cost when it comes to health care? Let me describe two basic approaches to health care. One approach is to wait until people acquire or contract diseases or suffer injuries and only then to address it. In other words, wait for people to get sick and then intervene in an attempt to cure the sickness. Or, or wait until people get injured and then intervene to heal the injury. That's one possibility. Another possibility is to take steps in advance before the disease or sickness occurs 
before the injury occurs. Do things now to prevent or forestall those things from happening. And what Conley says is preventive health care is almost always cheaper than what she calls reactive health care. So let me read a short quotation or two <clears throat> from page 312 on the difference between preventive care <clears throat> and what Conley calls reactive care. Okay, page 312. She says, what is needed are publicly provided strategies for preventive care. We need strategies provided for in a public way, not just leaving it to individuals, but the public, the, the government needs to formulate programs that are designed to prevent sickness, injury, and disease. She goes on to say on that same page, Preventive care, quote, is typically less expensive than care after people become ill. And it may also, in many cases, provide a higher standard of health care than mere reactive treatment. Okay, so she's contrasting preventive care and reactive care or reactive. Notice react means someone else has acted and you're reacting to it. So something has happened and you um, only then kick into gear and do something about it. That's a reaction. Uh, we could also coin some other terms, if you will. You've probably heard these. We could describe Conley's preferred approach as proactive and her disfavored approach is reactive. Okay? Proactive means doing things in advance before they happen to prevent them from happening. Be proactive. Reactive means waiting for things to happen and then reacting to them. And what she's saying is proactive policies or strategies are typically cheaper. So if our concern is health care costs, then we should focus on preventive care or proactive strategies. Another contrast is between preventive care and curative. Curative, C-U-R-A-T-I-V-E, meaning it means a strategy designed to cure diseases or sicknesses which have already occurred or taken place. So let's turn now to what Conley appears to think is the main source of health care costs. And it's a term I mentioned earlier today, lifestyles. Right? It's a term I'm sure you've heard. So let's see what she says. I'm going to start reading on page 312, and it bleeds over into page 313. So listen to this. Conley says, it is increasingly people's lifestyle rather than a, and that's a typo, rather than an unpredictable ailment that causes many of our problems today. Okay? It's, it's those lifestyles that are the culprit. Rather than treating lifestyle-related illnesses after they strike, it would be better to head them off before that happens. Better both for the care recipient, who would be healthier, and for the providers who would not need to spend so much money, unquote. So Conley's point is, if we really are concerned to minimize costs, then we should be looking at lifestyle. People make lifestyle choices, and maybe the government can do something about people's lifestyle choices. Government can influence people. I mean, what are the main ways to influence somebody? You can coerce people. Well, let me back up. One way you can influence people's decisions is through physical force, and governments have been known to do that. Right? Governments have a monopoly on force. They have police officers, security guards, and members of the military. Uh, other agents of the state can physically do things to the citizenry. Okay, So force, physical force, is one way to influence. Or maybe that's not the right word, influence. Physical force is one way to uh, get people to do what you want them to do. 
Okay, next, coercion. Coercion is not physical force, but you can think of it as the threat of physical force. So someone coerces when he or she makes a threat. Do this or else, or don't do this or else. Okay, so sometimes the government coerces people into doing or not doing things. In fact, when you pay your taxes, you do so under coercion. The government says you must pay your income tax. And if you don't, bad things will happen to you. We will come and get you. And if we find that you've evaded your required taxes, you can be made not only to, re to pay your taxes, but to pay interest for the time between when you owed them and when you eventually paid them, and even this thing called a penalty. So the taxes, the interest on those taxes, and a penalty for late payment. And, and you're going to regret that you didn't pay your taxes on time. So that's the power of government. It's coercion. Government threatens us. If we don't obey the law, then we run the risk of being um, harmed in various ways, imprisoned, fined, uh, even put to death in extreme cases. Okay, so I'm listing ways the government can influence the citizenry. Physical force, coercion. Third is manipulation. The government can do things to manipulate us. Manipulate has to do with the hands, right? It's from the Latin word M-A-I-N, which means hands. Um, to manipulate someone is to get your hands on someone and, and uh, treat them like putty in your hands. Some people are really good at manipulating others. You can, um, you can get people to feel guilty. If you can get someone to feel guilty about something, that person will be inclined to do something to alleviate the guilt. That's called a guilt trip putting a guilt trip on someone. That's a form of manipulation. If I, if I make you afraid, I can get you to do what I want you to do. Suppose for some reason I want you to stay in the house rather than go out. And suppose I know that you're afraid of snakes. I may lie to you and tell you that I saw a big snake in, near the porch outside. Uh, that may be enough to keep you inside, at least for a while. So I'm manipulating you, in this case by deceiving you about the presence of a snake. And there are a lot of ways to manipulate people. Um, you, manipulation is, often occurs by appealing to people's emotions, like guilt, fear, love. Have you heard the expression, if you loved me, you would do it? That's a form of manipulation that's commonly used. So manipulation is something the government might do to get us to make better decisions and that keep our health care costs down. And finally, there is something called persuasion, rational persuasion. The government might try to persuade the citizenry to eat a better diet, a healthier diet. Don't eat so much salt because salt is known to be associated with high blood pressure, which, is, uh, which causes premature death and other costly health problems. Uh, government may uh, try to help people avoid obesity by providing them with information about calories, right? the calories that are um, being consumed in a restaurant or in a soft drink or a beer or some other beverage or food. So government has at its disposal a lot of different tools. That's my point. Physical force would be the most extreme. And certainly if we can avoid that, we should. Coercion is less extreme than physical force. It's still pretty harsh, though. We don't want government to go around threatening us uh, too often. Um, uh, manipulation is also disrespectful. But I'd rather be manipulated than coerced or forced, I think, right? So it's, it's less harsh than those other two. And finally, rational persuasion, which often just means providing people with information that they can use for making decisions. And that's certainly something government can do, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. So let's 
continue thinking about lifestyles, right? Lifestyles are often the drivers of high healthcare costs. So if government can make change, help us make changes to our lifestyles, then government has a big role to play in keeping healthcare costs down, and we all benefit from that. Now let's talk a little bit about obesity. That may be an uncomfortable topic for some people, but Conley doesn't hesitate to discuss it. And that's because Conley is a brave philosopher. Um, she's not um, she's not politically correct in the sense that she's willing to speak the truth. Philosophers going way back to Socrates are um, have been brave. They are the original people who speak truth to power. Some of them paid dearly for it. In fact, Socrates, as you may know, lost his life because of his insistence on doing philosophy. Uh, I won't bother telling you the whole story here. You can look it up, go to the Wikipedia page on Socrates and read about his death. Um, he was put on trial in his beloved Athens and he was charged with corrupting the morals of the youth of Athens. He denied that he had done that. He was put on trial. He defended himself. He was convicted by a jury of his fellow citizens. The sentence for his um, conviction was death. His friends gave him an opportunity to escape and go to another city-state. He made an impassioned speech explaining why he would not go that he would stay and take his punishment. And he eventually drank a cup of a poisonous substance called hemlock and died. So Socrates is viewed as, an, as a martyr for the truth. Socrates was w insisted on speaking the truth, whatever the cost, however offensive it was to people, however much people might hate him for saying it, um, his goal was to, to acquire the truth, to form true beliefs, come what may, whatever the cost to himself or to others. So he's an inspirational figure for philosophers. And I'm sure Conley would tell you that she admires Socrates for his devotion to the truth. And here's what she says about obesity. Again, she's brave. It's a topic many people um, would not, um, would be reluctant to discuss. I've heard the term fat shaming, and I'm sure you have as well. Someone might accuse Conley in this long paragraph I'm about to read of fat shaming people. She doesn't use that term, but I think her response would be, I don't care what you call it. It's an important topic. I'm a philosopher, and I'm going to discuss it. So here's what she says. Page 313. It's one paragraph. Well, it's two paragraphs. The first one is long, the second one is short. And I need to read all of it because Conley thinks that obesity is the main driver of healthcare costs. And, if, and we've got to get it under control. If we don't get it under control, we will never have an adequate amount of healthcare for all of our citizens. Okay, consider obesity. Americans may be celebrating the fact that we are no longer the most obese nation on earth. Sadly, though, this is not because we have slimmed down, but because Mexico now has a percentage of obese citizens even beyond our own. And notice she has a footnote or an end note in which she documents that factual claim. If you don't believe her, check her source and see what it says. She says, we remain fat. We Americans remain fat. By present estimates, approximately 30% estimates vary, of American adults are merely overweight, and another 30% are obese. Discouragingly, despite education efforts, the age of onset for ob obesity is changing. Younger people are suffering from obesity more than previously. Increasing numbers of teenagers, children, and even preschoolers are obese. One in ten children becomes obese between the ages of two to five, and five percent of six to eleven-year-olds are severely obese. 
This is bad all around. Obesity, as is widely known, is associated with diabetes, coronary heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke, metabolic syndrome, and colon, breast, endometrial, and gallbladder cancers. Obesity is associated with all of those disorders, some of which are quite deadly, as you know. At present, 40% of American adults face a lifetime risk of developing diabetes, an increase of up to 20% since the 1980s, which is not that long ago. I remember the 80s well. The costs to the individual can thus be very great, not to mention that for many people, in addition to causing actual disease, obesity also interferes with activities they, that they would otherwise like to engage in, including exercise. Obesity, furthermore, is typically bad for self-esteem, which in turn has, negative, has a negative impact on mental health. In terms of money, the medical cost of obesity to society, which is less than the overall economic cost, is about $190 million per year and estimated to rise. Now, I have written in my margin billion. I don't know why I made that change. It may be that if you look at footnote 10, you'll see that the source for this information shows it as billions. And Conley mistakenly wrote $190 million per year. So let's just kind of bracket that. It's at least $190 million, but I, I'm thinking it's 1,000 times that amount. It's billion, 190 billion. Some have estimated the cost of obesity to be on a par with the cost of smoking. And some have estimated it to be greater than the cost of smoking. It is clearly one major reason for skyrocketing health care costs, a serious societal burden. Now, let me repeat that because this is why she's talking about obesity at all. Obesity is clearly one major reason for skyrocketing health care costs, a which is a serious societal burden. Now, that's the long paragraph. Let me read the short one, and then we can go back to my notes. On the good side, in case you're wondering, there's a good side. Obesity is preventable. That means it's capable of being prevented. And it's preventable without the need for medical intervention. What is needed is a better ratio of calories consumed to calories expended. Less fattening food, more exercise. On the bad side, the fact that it is preventable does not mean that there's a typo there. It should be mean, not meant. On the bad side, the fact that it is preventable does not mean that preventing it is easy. Society needs to take steps, and the most effective steps will be regulatory. So in that long quotation that we just went over, Conley is not only pointing out the facts of obesity, which you can check up on if you doubt her. She gives the sources for her information. But she's also pointing out that obesity is preventable largely by inducing individuals to make better decisions as to diet and exercise. Think about it. A person's body weight is a function of three things. The person's metabolism, which is the rate at which calories are burned. Secondly, caloric intake, how many calories are taken in. And third, caloric expenditure which is how many calories are burned off through exercise. And exercise doesn't mean necessarily a formal activity. For example, I ride my bike on average 20 miles per day. As soon as I get this lecture posted, I'm out on my bike. Um, I plan to ride 25 miles today. I'm a little bit behind already for the year. But I average 20 miles per day. I ride all year round. Okay, that's caloric expenditure. If I rode more, if I rode 30 miles per day on average, I would be burning off more calories. 
Now, Conley is not suggesting that you go out and do something that regimented. If you want, that's fine, and that's a good thing. But she's talking about simple things like moving. Don't, don't be sedentary all day sitting in a chair or on a couch. Get out. Take a walk. Uh, incorporate movement into your daily life and your daily activities. Um, if you want, you can go to a gym and work out. You can take up a sport and play, join a softball league or a volleyball league, go play tennis with friends, uh, anything. Every little thing you do when you move your body involves ex an expenditure of calories. So let's go back to my point. There are three things that determine your body weight. Metabolism, caloric intake, caloric expenditure. Now I'm going to tell you something that you may not know. But I know it firsthand because I'm older than you are. I'm almost 64. What I know, what I've learned is that as you age, your metabolism slows. It gets slower. Now, it may not happen until you're 40 or thereabouts, but it will happen. It happens to everyone. So the greatest cruelty is this, that as you age and as your metabolism slows, there are three things that happen. Either you eat less or you exercise more or you gain weight. It's, it's a law of nature. There's nothing you can do about it. So my strategy is, since I don't want to gain weight, is, and since I like to eat and I don't want to cut back on my food, I eat about the same as I always have but I exercise more than I ever did, believe it or not. I've always been active. I've run 11 marathons and many, many 10Ks and 5Ks and half marathons and all that. And I've been cycling for 40 years. <clears throat> but I have to say that I ride more than I ever have in 40 years, partly because I live in a place where I have access to a trail and uh, I can go out on a daily basis and, and enjoy myself and burn calories. So Conley's point is you can um, affect in a very firsthand and important way, you can affect how much you weigh. If you are obese or inclined to obesity, there are things you can do um, starting right now to change that. Or if you're not yet obese, to prevent it from occurring. So get your diet under control. Uh, make changes to your caloric expenditures in the way of exercise. There's not much you can do about your metabolism. That's going to slow with age, whatever you do about it. Okay, so let's get back to Conley. Um, now that we have obesity on the table, we will re continually refer to it because that's the main driver of healthcare costs. Let's turn to what Conley calls types of regulation. What types, what kinds of things can the government do to help its citizens make better decisions, uh, either by coercing them, forcing them, manipulating them, or persuading them? So I'm going to get started on this today. I'll do two or three of them, and then we'll pause. And on Saturday, when we come back to Conley's essay, we'll pick up with where I left off. I'm trying to leave a certain amount of material for Saturday's lecture. So I'll take it up close to an hour and then we'll pause. Okay, I'm going to talk about the following types of regulation. Maybe I'll just list them all for you right now and then we'll go over them one at a time. The first thing government can do is educate people by providing them with information. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the government might ban certain advertising. The government might prevent the advertising of sugar products, sugary products. Now, I'm not saying Conley is advocating that. She's saying that's something government could do. Maybe it won't need to resort to that, but government has banned advertising of other products like tobacco. So it's a possibility. Third, Government can stop subsidizing certain 
products like sugar. Government subsidizes a great many agricultural products, corn, soybeans, tobacco. Did you know our government is to this day subsidizing the production of tobacco product, tobacco for tobacco products? No, that's insane, isn't it? Why are we subsidizing tobacco growers so that they can stay in business while at the same time doing everything we can to discourage people from using tobacco products. Okay, that's one of the great mysteries of our society. Another thing government might do is tax certain products or certain forms of consumption. We, we know there are gas taxes. Whenever you fill up your car with gasoline, a certain amount of it goes to the government in the form of taxes, some to the federal government, some to the state government, maybe even some, into, some to the local government. So taxation is always a viable option for government. Next, government might limit portion sizes in restaurants. Right? We'll talk more about that in a, in a, well, probably on Saturday, we'll talk more about that. But government could decree that restaurants serve meals that do not go beyond a certain number of calories. Okay, that's pretty draconian, but that's something government may do. Um, next, the government might ban certain substances altogether. Now that would be pretty extreme. Um, we, do we do ban certain things though. Trans fats are banned already by government. That's a substance. That's a particular food item, trans fats. They're banned. You can't use them. Manufacturers can't include them in their food products. Okay, so we'll talk about, about banning certain foods or substances. And finally, government might engage in arm twisting, what I call arm twisting. Government has a lot of moral authority, if, 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 which is backed up by legal authority. The government might simply call business leaders, restaurant leaders, uh, hotels and other industries, call them in to a conference and twist their arms to get them to provide smaller portions to their customers or to reduce the amount of salt that is being included in their meals or to take the salt shakers off the tables. So. That's a list of all of the things that Conley discusses that might be done by government. Let's go back and talk about the first two or three and then we'll pick up on Saturday with our list. Let's talk about education, first of all. By education, I mean educating people in the way of providing them with information. So government might provide information to its citizenry in schools, public schools, for example. Uh, government might um, have as part of its curriculum in the schools, teaching children about caloric intake, caloric expenditure, metabolism, and so on, to make students informed about foods and, uh, and diseases and things like diabetes and obesity. Restaurants, Government can mandate that restaurants put on their menu the number of calories for each entree or appetizer or each drink. Okay? Now, the, the patrons of a restaurant can ignore those calorie uh, lists if they want, but some, some customers may notice them. Right? The goal would be to get the attention of someone and get the person to make a different choice than he or she was going to make. So it might happen like this. I go to a restaurant, I look over the menu, I have a taste for a certain entree that day, and I'm just about to order it when I notice that it has the number of calories listed. Suppose it says 1,200 calories. I might think, hmm, I don't, that's a lot of calories. Um, more than I thought it had, maybe I should order a different entree. So I scan the menu and I notice that some other entree, which I would enjoy as well, is only 900 calories. I may decide 
When I compare the two entrees, I may decide to go with the 900 calorie entree. So I've saved 300 calories. Now that's just one occasion, but it starts me thinking about calories. I may be more inclined in future visits to restaurants to look at the number of calories. I may even uh, approach the proprietor of the next restaurant I go to and say, uh, would you please prepare new menus that have the number of calories uh, for each of your uh, offerings? The, um, the proprietor of that restaurant may think that's a good idea and may have menus, new menus produced. So you can do some good by simply asking that the number of calories be provided. I've noticed when I go to restaurants that more and more restaurants have the calorie amounts listed alongside their <clears throat> offerings, whether it's on a menu in a fast food place up above you where you're ordering or on a menu where you're seated in a restaurant. So I, I think it's happening gradually anyway, but perhaps it could be sped up a little bit. I think Conley would encourage that. Now, the more information, the better. And who can complain? The nice thing about educating people is it's not forcing them to do anything. It's not coercing them to do anything. And it's not really even manipulating people. It's the provision of information, facts, factual information, in the hope that people will use it as a basis for making better, meaning more rational decisions. Decisions that will redound to their benefit and ultimately to society's benefit. Because if you keep your weight down, you are less likely to impose costs on other citizens by drawing upon the healthcare system. So ultimately, it's not just about you, it's about other people whom you may affect if you make bad decisions. So calorie counts. Now, even young children, I have found, can understand the concept of empty calories. Do you know what that means, empty calories? Uh, take a soft drink, for example. A soft drink like Coca-Cola or, or Pepsi-Cola or 7-Up. Um, a a non-diet soft drink, like standard Coca-Cola, has a certain number of calories. Um, I don't know offhand how many it is, but let's suppose it's 100 calories or 140 or something like that. Now, are you, if you were to drink that soda, are you getting any nutrients, any vitamins, any important minerals? Probably not. You're probably getting almost nothing of any nutritional value. So what are you getting when you drink that soft drink? You're getting lots of calories with almost nothing on the other side of the scale that benefits you. You're getting empty calories. Now, in the standard case, Suppose I eat a donut. Suppose I buy a donut, which I happen to like. I'm sure most people do. A nice, gooey donut. Boy, I'm making myself hungry. <laughs> so, suppose, sorry. Suppose I get a nice, gooey donut. Now, maybe that is 150 calories. It's probably more than that, but let's say it's 150. I assume that, that if I were to eat that donut, I would get some nutrients, some minerals, something of nutritional value, unlike the soft drink. So while it may be bad to get 150 or more calories from eating that donut, at least there's something on the other side of the scale that's of benefit. The calories you get in eating the donut are not empty. Okay, so I think even children, if you were to explain it to them, could understand this concept of empty calories. And certainly adults, any normal adult can understand it. The problem with education or providing people with information, as you know, is, according to Conley, it does not seem to work very well. I mean, education, I'm sorry, providing people with information is one thing, but getting people to act on that information, that's another thing. Have you heard the expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. That's the problem. Providing information is leading the horse to water, 
but getting the horse to drink the water now that the horse is there, that's, that's the hard part. So uh, you need to get people's attention. Some people might just ignore the calorie counts that they see on menus. They, they filter them out. They've got selective attention. They're looking at the, the picture of the hamburger and fries up above the clerk. They're looking at the cost and maybe looking at the ingredients or what it comes with. And right alongside of it is the calorie count. People just filter it out. Okay, so it's a matter of attention. People have selective attention. And I don't know of any way to get people to attend to the calorie count. I suppose you could make it flash, like a flashing neon light, 720 calories, a thousand calories. <laughs> Or maybe there would be a buzzer. Whenever people look at a certain item on the overhead menu, a buzzer goes off near the calorie count. I'm, being, I'm starting to be silly, but there are ways to get people's attention. You know that because you see ads on TV. By the way, have you noticed that <clears throat> when you're watching a television program and a, and a commercial advertisement comes on, the advertisement is often at a louder volume than the program was. Have you noticed that? I sure have. And I, wonder, I wondered why is that? I think it's because, this is just my theory, I think it's because when commercials come on television, many people get up and go to the kitchen to get a drink or, or, or something, or run to the restroom. Uh, I think the commercials get louder so that as people are going away from their TV, they can still hear what's being said on the television. At any rate, that's my theory. And it certainly is annoying that the volume goes up for the ads. It's designed to get your attention, whether you're still see seated in front of the TV or moving around in the vicinity of the TV. So getting people's attention, retaining people's attention, and most importantly, motivating people. That's why education is not always effective. Why don't we stop there? I was gonna go and do the next one, but we're very close to an hour in, and I, I think we've left ourselves enough material to spend an hour on Saturday as well. And then we'll be done with Conley. Um, we'll have spent three days on Conley. Remember now, the exam will cover three essays, Conley, Cohen, and an essay by two individuals named Emanuel. I'll call them the Emanuels. Each of the three essays will be covered on the exam with about a third of the questions. So a third of the exam questions will be on Conley, about a third will be on Cohen, and about a third will be on the Emanuels. Okay, so take each essay seriously because there will be quite a few questions on each of them. So enough for today. Um, sorry, I got silly there a couple of times. Uh, it's a serious topic, it really is. So people who suffer from obesity, um, have often, many of them have serious health problems. So it really is no laughing matter. Not that I was laughing uh, at that or at obese people, I certainly wasn't. Anyway, let's pick up with banning television advertising when we return for our next lecture on Saturday. So have a great day and make sure you've read all of Conley before you view the next lecture on Saturday. And I would recommend that you get started on reading Cohen by um, in the next few days, at least get started on it. Okay, see you then.